I'm James the Box Office Artist and welcome to episode two of Ask the Artist, okay? And thank you for all the questions that I've received. Uh, I've received some through messages and on my YouTube channel and on my Facebook page. Uh, so, you know, I I'm going to take this opportunity now to answer another question and this is a question that I get a lot. And this comes from Kal-El and of course it's come from Superman. Uh, the question is, episode, well it's not really a question, it's a statement. It says episode two. How to be a comic book artist. <laughs> okay, so really, it's a question without being a question. Uh, so thank you, Kal El, because actually, this is a question I get a lot um, ever since I started working in comic books a long time ago. There's a lot I could talk about for this subject. So this video is actually going to be split into two parts. Okay, this first part, I'm going to tell you my experience on how I broke in to the comic book industry because this was a long time ago. This is like in the year 2000. It's in the year 2000. Things have changed since then. That was 15 years ago. So I thought, okay, um, for this first episode, I'll tell you how I broke in. And then for the next episode, I would tell you how I would try to break in uh, today with all the social media, all the everything that's going on now, uh, how we could use that to our advantage today, how would I would use that to my advantage today. Okay, so let's get back to my history. My final year of college, uh, I went to uh, the Fan Expo in Toronto at that time and I put together a sample of uh, sequential comic art. Like I've been drawing comics my whole life and I put it together a sample of comic art and I'm going to show you that sample right now. It was a sample uh, for Cyberforce, uh, Ripclaw, and I believe what I did was I took an old uh, Ripclaw story that I thought wasn't drawn the best it could have been. Now I don't even remember what issue it was. So I took that script from that, or at least I wrote it down, and then I decided to interpret it in my way how I would have drawn it. Okay, and as you can tell here, this is Ripclaw and Velocity from Cyberforce. And so I drew these uh, four pages, and I brought it them to Fan Expo. And I showed them around to different publishers at that time. Uh, I showed it to Top Cow, uh, Matt Hawkins, who even today, I believe, is the, the, uh, the COO of uh, Top Cow. Uh, I showed it to him, and he really liked it. He said, oh, this is great, this is great. Why don't I give you a card uh, to the studio? Right? He never sent me the card after that. Like he, he meets hundreds of people. He, he probably just forgot. And then the second uh, company I went to was a company called Dreamwave Productions at that time. At that time, Dreamwave Productions was the only uh, studio with notoriety that was in Toronto at that time. I live in Toronto. That was the only one that was local at that time. So I thought if I could get into Dreamwave, you know, it would be great. I could still live from home and, you know, I wouldn't have to move anywhere, you know. It, would, it was an ideal situation if I could get there. There I met a friend of mine. Today, he's still a good friend of mine. He's in the Philippines doing some amazing art. His name is Sigmund Torre. And I showed him my work. And I wasn't expecting them to like it because my style, as you can tell from my samples, they are an American type style. My influence at that time, Jim Lee, Mark Silvestri, that kind of stuff. So Dreamwave was doing more anime, manga-ish type artwork. So I wasn't expecting anything from them, but he saw it and he said, you know what, this is really good. This is good stuff. And he gave me a card. Now, what I tried to do after that, for the next couple weeks, I tried to get an interview with them. So I would call the number that was on the card that Sigmund gave to me. Here's the thing, every time I would call during the day, no one would pick up the phone. Nobody would answer the phone. I kept calling morning, uh, morning, midday, afternoon. No one would pick up the phone. I'm like, okay, maybe I got the wrong number. And then I read uh, in Wizard Magazine that Pat Lee, he was saying there that, oh, I have two and a half pages to do today. Good thing I just woke up. And at that, he said, and then the article said it was at midnight at that time. I said, okay. Looks like these guys are night owls. They only work during the night time. So that night, I called at three o'clock in the morning to Dreamwave, and someone picked up. And who picked up? It was Roger Lee, that was Pat Lee's brother at the time. And uh, he was like the vice president of the company. And he said, and I told him that I met Sigmund, and Sigmund liked my art, and he said, you know what? Why don't you come in the next night, come in, bring your portfolio, and we'll talk. Okay, so that night, the next time I came with a portfolio in hand, and I put together a few pieces together, okay? So I, th I threw together, uh, you know, just some generic pinups and stuff. And one thing I did, because I noticed that Pat Lee uses background artists. So one thing I did, I took two pinups that they have done, one by Sigmund Tori for Dark Minds, one by Pat Lee for Warlands, that did not have a background. It was just like a colored background. So I took those, I traced, 
I traced their uh, pencils, okay? And then I drew a background behind them, and I'll show you that right now. Uh, if it's not showing already, I'll show you that. These two pieces here. So I drew a background behind them. And I showed Pat Lee, we sat down in Pat Lee's office, he took a look at my, at my artwork, my portfolio. And, you know, my, my uh, sequential stuff he didn't really care for too much, but what stopped him were these two pieces here. Because these sh showed I could do backgrounds. One thing coming out of technical illustration, I learned how to draw buildings. I learned how to do perspective. I learned how to do backgrounds. Even today, my eye is very well trained in perspective where I don't need to put perspective lines anymore. Where everything just comes from my head. I could tell if something looks wrong or looks right. But he stopped at those two pages. He said, you know what? You were a really good background artist. Why don't we start there and let you be a background artist? Now, right when he said that, someone barged in and said, hey, uh, Neon Cyber number five, we need to get this issue out, but we need some backgrounds done. Pat, what do we do? He looked at them, and then he looked at me, and he's like, well, are you free tonight? <laughs> so, so there, I did my very first uh, professional work. It was Neon Cyber number five, uh, doing uh, backgrounds for uh, Liu Kang. No, not the video game, uh, ca video game uh, character. Uh, it was an actual penciler. Liu Kang, very talented artist. And I did uh, the backgrounds, for that page, and then from there, it started from there. Th from there, Pat, I became Pat Lee's major background artist, starting with Dark Mind's Witchblade, and I'll show you some of the images I've done for Dark Mind's Witchblade. These are the first four pages, and Top Cow thought Pat did these first four pages. They went crazy for these four pages. They didn't know that I did them, but that's fine. That was part of being a background artist. I was Pat Lee's major background artist for a few years. And then uh, after working in the trenches, doing backgrounds, the opportunity came to do Transformers for Dreamwave. Now, because I could draw backgrounds so well, I was a natural to do Transformers. In fact, when we were trying to get the license, me and my friend Chris Saracini, we put together a three-page uh, sample that we put together as part of the package. That really helped sold, uh, sell uh, Dreamwave to have the license for Transformers at that time. And because of that, Pat Lee did the main title, and then he said, James, why don't you take the second title? So I got to do Transformers Armada number one. Uh, at that time, for my personal comic book popularity, that would be 2002. So that's the gist on how I got my foot into the door uh, to be a comic book artist. Now, there's more Dreamwave stories, things that happen at Dreamwave, of course, as everyone who knew the history of Dreamwave, uh, there's lots more stories. I will go in depth into that. What can we learn from this? Well, that's why we're splitting in this into the two parts. The next episode next week, I will tell you all the points that we could take from my story and also things that I would do if I was trying to get back into comics today. That's, uh, that's it. That's how I broke into comics, and I hope you enjoyed the story. If you did, uh, please do let me know. Please comment below. Please uh, hit that like button. Uh, please also check out some of my previous videos. Please also hit me up on my Facebook page. Uh, a lot of you have been um, liking my Facebook page. Please uh, continue to do so. Also, the images that you saw in this video today, you will see, and, uh, see on my Facebook page. I will post them there so you can take a longer look at them. And yeah, and any questions you would have for Ask the Artist, please do let me know. Hit me up on all my social media networks. Please, please follow me on Instagram, Vine, and Twitter because because daily you will see what I am working on and what to expect going forward uh, with my channel. And thank you again for all your support. Uh, it means so much to me. Thank you for watching. Let's continue to be creative, to be innovative, and most importantly, keep drawing.